Okay, Luis. Uh, I wanted to make some comments on the first presentation. Uh, first of all, I, I guess I find it a little bit discouraging that um, uh, you say it's not clear how the official results were done. Um, about two years ago, I was actually uh, working with that survey data and helping the World Bank team help the government uh, come up with those results. I'm not going to fully defend the methodology. I will say that the reason why they did a fixed share uh, with one national poverty line in 2010 was that was done in 2004. And the view at the time was that if they then uh, um, brought in uh, improvement in the poverty line, like having, um, uh, say, four poverty lines for the different regions instead of uh, one, they'd have to recalculate the 2004. Uh, the NSO was firmly against recalculating the 2004 uh, because they felt it would look like the books were being cooked. So I just want to, I think it's important to think about as we think about different ways of doing poverty lines and, and how, how to do it. Uh, it's not that I'm persuaded that was the right decision. It's just a, an important uh, consideration. Now, in terms of the, pro I, I am, however, a little bit surprised by your results. Prima facie, if the, if the food share is going up, that is a indication that people are poor. Uh, not perfect. Right? But, I mean, we start with an Ingle curve, and it has some indications. So, um, so I'm a little bit surprised about your bundles. Um, the second thing I will say is that um, uh, this may not be exactly on, this particular story may be not exactly on the NSO website. But what I know is that when we first looked at the pri national price index, the National Consumer Price Index, and the food prices that were obtainable from the survey, the 2004 and the 2010, we noticed a huge gap between the food inflation as measured by the prices in the survey and the food inflation as measured by the prices in the market and the National uh, Consumer Price Index that was computed. Now, that's not unusual, although the size of this gap was huge. Um, as a result, however, um, some technical assistance was provided uh, by um, Stat South Africa, who, who came in and re-estimated uh, the food price index over that period, and it was adjusted substantially upward. And it was that new price index which was used for, to compute um, the poverty line. I am surprised that you are coming up with a lower food inflation uh, using the prices in the survey than the restated national prices, which the poverty line done by Stat South Africa, which was significantly below the prices that we were able to compute from the prices in the survey. Um, so, so, so that is kind of a, a puzzle to me. Uh, we also did a survey to survey mapping between the two, and we, uh, of course, using mostly assets. And one of the things we notice is that the um, inequ rural inequality widened substantially. And the increase in assets in rural areas primarily went to the upper income farmers. Um, so the people who got sheet, more sheet roof, for example, tended to be uh, the upper income farmers, and the lower end of the distribution did not show uh, an increase in assets. So that also um, gave, that survey to survey mapping should be available. Uh, if you haven't seen it, you can talk to Talib. Tal uh, Tal and uh, or anyone on the World Bank team, they can provide it. So that also gave us some confidence that regardless of whether the um, levels were right, that the direction suggested uh, not too much poverty reduction between uh, 2004 and uh, 2010. So I am a little surprised by your results. Um, finally, uh, I, would then, I would suggest that this experience with the consumer price index uh, maybe uh, perhaps might lead one to question the GDP figures. So perhaps it's possible that GDP did not increase at 7% uh, per annum. I know that there was going to be uh, further work to strengthen the national accounts. I don't know how that proceeded. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the quality of national accounts data in Sub-Saharan Africa, and I won't uh, repeat it. But it maybe uh, uh, might this these it might suggest why um, the poverty reduction wasn't uh, uh, what you expect. That maybe growth wasn't actually um, as high as you got.
Thank you for two very interesting presentations. Um, I had a question about the first one. I just um, a comment and a question. So the question is: It looked to me, uh, by the numbers that you put up there, that urban poverty had fallen more than rural poverty. Is that right? So I find that puzzling, given that I thought the program was targeted at the rural poor, and um, which kind of leads to my second comment, which is. You know, you posited this as um, a puzzle, why poverty isn't going down. But it, as, a, as, a spe as an onlooker, observer that's not intimately familiar with Malawi, knowing about the food price hikes and so on in the latter half of the 2000s, um, it wouldn't have surprised me if poverty increased over that, the time period that you're looking at, 2005 to 2011, because food prices spiked in 2008, right? And they stayed pretty high. So I'm just, it's just a question. And then, um, and that relates to the second presentation. Um, um, do, have you found any way to um, include in your, um, in your overall, your, your general equilibrium analysis trade? And I've heard stories about maize being locked up in warehouses and going to rot because there was so much maize. I mean, is that true? And, and, and if it is true, is there something that can be done about that? And um, more broadly, like, what about this FIST program as it relates to other countries in Africa? Because if everybody does this, if every country does this, right, won't there be a surplus, a glut in Africa? I don't know. Maybe that's a pie in the sky scenario. But um, anyway. Uh, I, I, again, on Richard's presentation, I wanted to ask if your inflation data are credible. Uh, Malawi is not such a big country. Uh, you have much, much higher prices in the rural north in the first year, and you have much, much lower inflation in the rural north. Uh, why, why, why is that? I mean, is, is that plausible? And I mean, you said your fixed basket results gave something similar to the official. They don't. The difference between the different rural areas is very different, and again, the rural north comes out, out here. So I sort of question the, the basic inflation data that you're using. Okay, thank you for the comments and questions. I will try to address uh, some of them. I think my colleagues can step in as well. Um, on, the, on the urban uh, poverty decline, that it's bigger than the rural decline, I mean, we, we come up with a story here which is very speculative, that actually because urban areas are net consumers of maize, and because of a massive uh, increase in production, prices are significantly lower, so they're benefiting from the reduction in prices. Also, the logistically, it's, it's urban households that are going to benefit from trans transporting this fertilizer or maize or whatever to, to the rural areas. So it's kind of speculative, but that's one of the arguments that we make in the paper, that maybe that is driving this uh, decline uh, in, 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 in urban areas, which is bigger than the rural areas. Um, on, on inflation, I mean, inflation figures are dodgy. I, mean, I, agree, I agree with you, they're very dodgy. Uh, and actually, just to come back to what Louise was talking about, it's, we have two sets of conversion factors that we, we, we are given by the NSO, right? So, so we used both. Uh, the results that we get are totally different. Okay. We tried to play around with them, coming up with averages of the conversion factors, using conversion factors for one region. We tried different uh, ways of uh, fixing this conversion factor problem, but finally we ended up with uh, what we have here at the moment. It's, it's an issue. It's a big issue. We talked to them. Actually, what we have presented here, some of the findings were also presented at the NSO to see, I mean, to have a chat with them and have a sense of what is going on exactly. But again, it wasn't clear uh, as to what was uh, driving this issue of conversion factors. Actually, conversion factors are a key part of what we're finding here. Because it seems to me that whatever we choose to, to convert our different units are 
kind of driving what we, we end up getting. Um, I've, I've noted what you've raised about the redistribution uh, in the, towards the upper end in rural areas. I think it's something that we can also include maybe in the paper. Uh, we have interactive act actually actively with TARIP. I think we had a meeting, is it to meet? But we have through email we have kind of uh, interacted with him, but yeah, but 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 actually we got the conversion factors from him. So so yeah, so that, that, yeah, so otherwise other issues that I've raised I think who, who, uh, with my co host as was thinking about them. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Louise. I also really appreciate your your comments and uh, insights. I mean, we've we've been to the NSO, and it's it's sadly, it's it's quite clear that they don't really know what's going on in the with the conversion factors, with the rev revision by done by Stats South Africa. We haven't been able to get answers from them on on that or technical documentation. Talib, as you know, is a very busy guy, so it's 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 quite hard to to get him to to uh, to meet with us. So it's it, it's been a struggle to to kind of fully understand what went into the NSO analysis. Um, you know, I'm a bit concerned, frankly, about the the inflation, you know, revised inflation estimates. You have, you know, widely differ, differing rural and urban inflation rates for food and non-food components, and magically, in the end, you know, when they you know, combine and estimate a, a, a national average inflation estimates exactly the same for urban and rural, 128.9%. Um, looks like a bit of magic, to be honest. Um, so, 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 you know, we'd love to get to the bottom of that. And, um, yeah, so, so thanks for your comments. Um, Andy, on the rural north, I mean, it's, it's a puzzle. Again, with some of those conversion factors, the north has it as its own unique set of conversion factors, which we decided to throw away because it's just too too strange. In the north, they consume a lot of fish and cassava, and some of those co conversion factors for fish and cassava had been clearly changed, and, 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 and we need to, to, to get Talib maybe again to explain to us, but you know, some of these are you know, for fish 45 times lower in the north than in, in other areas for dried fish, um, and it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a food consumption item that's consumed, um, I think about 40% of calories come from fish and cassava. And, and those two conversion factors have been manipulated to, I don't know, achieve what? Maybe, you know, not get a 16% reduction in poverty. Um, so there's some really strange things going on in, in, in those conversion factors, and that is something that we continue to work with. Um, we have a colleague in, in Washington who's uh, doing stuff, stuff on nutrition, and he's really spent many, many hours on this and actually sent a new set yesterday, which we need to start looking at. Um, the um, Maggie on trade, yes. I mean, there's there's been lots of questions asked about where is all this extra maize. The the production <coughs> increase that we get of about 300,000 tons is is believable. The official estimate said we produced over a million tons extra, 1.5 million. And everyone's sort of saying, well, where the hell is the maize? Because it's not in the silos. It wasn't exported. You can't export that much maize on the back of a bicycle. Um, so um, it, I, I think it's simply a case of overinflated. Um, maize production estimates, possibly to make the program look good, um, and, and that then ultimately um, drives the the uh, national growth estimates as well, or the national the, the GDP estimates as well for agriculture. Um, so, so absolutely, I think the six seven percent GDP growth is 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 a is an overstatement. Um, so the truth probably lies somewhere in between, uh, moderate growth, mo moderate poverty reduction, um, rather than, you know. Okay, can you please take the last set of, que of questions because we only have five minutes? Please go ahead. Yeah, I guess the issue with the, you know, the food and the non-food, uh, did you look at the, the national um, CPI numbers for non-food inflation and how that relates to, I mean, you know, you've got your unit values that someone's a bit concerned about because you're looking at apples and oranges with chairs and whatever else, um, but it would be helpful to, to see that. And, the more I hear you, would, you know, these conversion factors and the way you set up the paper about, you know, trying to sort of understand the rationale for growth and poverty reduction. I don't know, maybe you have too many degrees of freedom, but that's being a bit naughty on, on my part. Okay, my name is Haruna and I'm from Uganda. So my uh, question is to... Uh, the last presenter, Mr. Uh, Mr. Carl. 
So, uh, I'm much interested in the wider uh, picture of the of the analysis, which uh, you know uh, seems to have uh, serious policy implications. And uh, from that analysis, uh, it much shows that uh, much of the increments and the reductions in poverty uh, much depend on the productivity of the uh, fertilizers. Perhaps if the fertilizers still work well, and maybe there is increment in uh, 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 mass production and so on, then we can see the reduction in poverty and so on. But uh, uh, my skepticism lies from the fact that here is one point or one factor which actually stands out to be responsible for the uh, all the for, for the positivism which the analysis shows. And uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, the, the, earlier, uh, the earlier level of maybe welfare had a contribution of perhaps zero factors. I know there can also be other factors which can also uh, influence the uh, productivity of the uh, of the fertilizers, for instance, the quality of the soil and you know the weather and so on. And uh, uh, to me, if uh, uh, all these uh, credit is given to the uh, fertilizer section, then I would wish to know your uh, opinion on if perhaps you would respond that you would uh, uh, you would recommend the continuity of the uh, program, which is only dependent on perhaps uh, a single. Uh, a single kind of uh, uh, factor, you know, to, to drive an economy. And I think, you know, uh, that's how, you know, we see so many scenarios and, you know, people think, you know, there is all this production and it's not being seen, uh, being uh, exported and so on. And, you know, with much of the policy makers in Africa, you're going to tell him that perhaps he's going to continue pumping money into the subsidy. And, you know, maybe something else needs to uh, to, to explain the difference, but maybe uh, not only the uh, uh, the fertilizer. So my interest is in your opinion, your own opinion as to whether perhaps you would recommend policy to uh, actually uh, sustain the program for some time, or maybe uh, you would limit the uh, sustainability of a uh, program to, to a certain duration of time, or perhaps maybe if you've not, you know, going ahead to assess how sustainable or for how long this positivism due to the fertilizer can go, maybe, uh, you know, you would still also guide in that way. Thank you. Said so a couple of quick questions, one for each of the presenters. Um, on the uh, on the Richard's presentation, I was wondering if you worked. I know you mentioned IHS one, and I and I've dealt with it. Data set, it's a little difficult. But as a robustness check, or it would probably be a, a bit of work. But if you could see what your poverty lines look like if you change from one to two and then two to three, because it does kind of come across as as you were, maybe were looking for something, or you had questions about three, and and so uh, one to two would might help. Uh, looking, you know, giving a better full image of, of what's going on. Uh, and then for Carl, I was wondering if you, if you made any assumptions about targeting of the program. I know that there's been a lot of questions about FISP and whether or not it actually was um, given to kind of poor households and if, if those assumptions would affect the, the poverty reduction measurements that you came up with. Thank you. Uh, on the on the using IHS one and IHS well, okay, using all the three wa waves of the IHS, I mean that would be that would be great, but the problem with IHS one is the the coverage of the consumption uh, module is not as extensive as uh, IHS two and IHS three, so that limits actually what what, what you can do. Uh, so, so, and this is why, actually, if you look at IHS2 and IHS3, in terms of the consumption mode, it's directly comparable. IHS1 is just totally different. So you can't, you can't, there's very little that you can do, I think, with IHS1. Um, on the non-food and food uh, component of inflation, I mean, we, we, in the paper, we talk about the official inflation figures in quite some detail. Um, inflation was 1.3.9, oh, that's a different Sorry? No, no, no. I think, I think, so there's a couple of different inflation rates going around, right? That's the CPI.
Thank you. So there is the CPI inflation rate, which is quite low, and then there is a 128%, which is higher than the CPI inflation, uh, and which was used to uh, inflate the poverty line. And then there is our inflation rate. So there's three different inflation rates going on. I think that's maybe the issue. Not the one that they, they use to adjust the, the poverty line. The, the official one is 77, I think, point three. The one that they use to adjust the poverty line is 128.9. So again, like I said, it's not clear why they use the other one. It's, it's just... Because there are too many mistakes Yeah, so... <laughs> um, I'll, I'll start with, um, with Ben's question on targeting. Very, very good question. Um, it, it's not something that we can deal with adequately uh, or easily in, 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 in the CG model. Because this is a program targeted at essentially what we will call producers or activities in our model, um, households are only linked to activities indirectly via factor markets. So if we want to target households, um, it's kind of tricky because you have to target them indirectly via, via the activities and via the, uh, the factor market. So we simply assume that... Um, that the benefits from the fertilizer or from the subsidized sectors are distributed among households in the same way that any maize income would be distributed. So it's kind of a, a you know neutral in that sense. It um, doesn't change our income distribution. Um, the question from the frontier, I, I, I must admit I did lose you along the way. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think maybe just to, to very briefly comment, I, I think, yes, I, I fully appreciate your point that it, it, it's not all about fertilizer and the other things also that impact on productivity. Um, that's certainly true. What we set out to do is not to, um, you know, because, because, you know, this is a parameter in our model and we show the sensitivity of outcomes to that parameter. What we're arguing is that we need to really understand how, you know, we can measure marginal returns to fertilizer use, which is a very, very tricky area, as you mentioned. I mean, it, it's about how, you, you know, it's, it's about other technologies as well and weeding and rainfall and all kinds of things. Um, and I think thus far, because of all these multicollinearity problems in estimating that, um, th that parameter um, econometrically, um, you know, the work that's been done so far, you know, falls a little bit short. So we still don't really know what the right number is. Um, you know, what we then do is, is just ex ante kind of Ketris Paribus type stuff. You know, we, we don't, you know, obviously we can recommend that farmers should adopt certain techniques and, you know, as, as a way to improve return, but I don't think that's, that's really the ultimate aim of the, of the study. Um, in terms of continuing this or having a, a kind of a sunset clause on this policy, um, you know, again, we evaluate the impact of the program and we see that it has positive returns. Um, a, a next phase would be to, to, to suggest policy alternatives and look at the impact under alternative programs. So again, you know, I don't think what we've done here um, necessarily helps us understand the question of whether we should stop doing this a few years down the line. Um, so, yeah. I'm afraid, I think we only have one minute. If you can be quick. That would be great. Just the financing uh, in your model of the fiscal expenditure, because you said you talked a little bit about, you know, you, you do account for absorption. How is that 3% financed? And, you know, do you have a fully specified model then that does that? Um, yeah, yeah, we just have a, a closure on our government budget where we would raise household income taxes uh, to finance the extra. That's not really how it happened, but it kind of accounts for the opportunity cost. I think. Um, you know, government. Re what, what government really did was you know, reorganise their budget to pay for this. So, um, you know, slightly different model. But you know, by, by, by taxing households, you kind of capture the opportunity cost of having this uh, this program. Okay. Um, our session has come to an end. I would like to thank all the participants, all comments and views and insights, it will make us now make sense of Malawi's, um, make sense of Malawi's poverty puzzle. So our colleagues, have, I guess, they will go back and look into all your comments and inputs to improve on their papers. So thank you very much for coming.